Welcome to episode 26 of Feeling Through Live. I am joined here today by Monica Godfrey Lear and Judy Weaver, and we have a great conversation ahead for you. Um, so before we kind of hop into everything, uh, why don't why don't you two both introduce yourselves? Judy, do you wanna do you wanna start? Sure. Um, my name is Judy Weaver, and I live here in Suffolk County, West Babylon. Um, I'm a mom and a student presently at Helen Keller Services uh, for the Blind in Islandia. Excellent. And uh, Monica, why don't you uh, introduce yourself as well? Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Monica Godfrey Lehrer. I work for Helen Keller National Center as a supervisor of three different departments, orientation and mobility, low vision and audiology. It's great to be here, Doug. Well, we're so happy to have you here both. And, uh, you know, let's just hop right into things. So the title for today's episode is White Cane Awareness Day, also known as White Cane Safety Day. I know depending on who you ask, they might say one or the other, but they're both the same day, October 15th. So we're using our Friday before October 15th to talk about White Cane Awareness Day, what it is, why it's important, why you should know about it, whether you use a white cane or not. So, you know, I want to hop right into what that is. So. Judy, could you start things off by just um, explaining to people what White Cane Awareness Day is and why it's important? Uh, um, well, it's a day to really... We, Judy, we're having a little bit of that, that internet problem that we uh, thought might be an issue. As those of you who are watching live know, Internets can be I, uh, one of those people things. People are using white canes to get around. Oh, Judy, sorry, I'm gonna just stop you for I a think moment. It was 1964. Can you hear me, Judy? Uh, yes. Oh, so can we we lost you for a moment because the internet the internet got a little choppy. So you want to do you want to start that over? Sure. Um, just that it, it's a day to really make aware of the the use of white canes. People using white canes to get around in their communities to do everyday things, those with low vision or no vision. Um, it was passed, I believe in 1964 by President Lyndon B. Johnson. Uh, there's a, a law giving the right of way also to people using canes crossing the street um, to make people more aware of the fact that, you know, we're out there and we're using canes to help us get, get around safely. Great. That's that's definitely a great uh, great start of introduction there. And, and Monica, maybe if you want to kind of fill in from your perspective, in your own words, what is White Cane Awareness Day and, and why it's important for, for everybody, not just people who use a white cane? Well, back in the 1960s, the National Federation for the Blind was really active in advocating for the rights of blind individuals. And they really were instrumental in helping this joint resolution with Congress to pass um, this um, White Cane Safety Day back in 1964. And initially, it was all about, you know, the white cane is a tool used by people who are visually impaired and blind to really probe their environment. You know, it's an extension of themselves to feel the ground and navigate. And, you know, through time, the, the tool really has become a, a symbol of independence and freedom among those who are visually impaired and blind. And that's really the greater thing. And that's why NFB has really changed the focus on the day from safety to awareness. It's so important for all of us to become aware that this really important tool is used by individuals not to say they're dependent, it's because they're independent. It's something that they need and it's an extension of themselves to be able to travel more freely and independently in the world. Yeah, beautifully put. And you know, I definitely want to get more into uh, everything having to do with White Cane Awareness Day. But before we do that, I'd love, Judy, I'd love to start with you. If you could tell us um, a little bit about kind of everything that leads up to, to, to you, you using a cane yourself. If you could kind of kind of take us back in time and give us a little bit more context mm -hmm. leading up to your personal cane usage. Mm -hmm. um, well, at a very young age, I had been diagnosed with uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. I think it was about a year and a half. 
and uh, my mom noticed I was having some trouble, you know, walking, and uh, the di the doctors had diagnosed me with uh, JRA, um, and there, the doctors also had sent me then to um, the eye doctors because uh, it caused inflammation in my eyes, which then led to glaucoma and cataracts. Judy, if you, if you can hear me, we're, your internet's getting a little choppy again, so I'm um, going to just see if and that... And so throughout my young life... Hey, Judy, sorry to interrupt. We Right when you were talking about cataracts, that's when we, it got a little jumbled. So if you could just take a step oh, back okay. to wherever you were. Yeah, we're, it's okay. Yeah. We're, you know, again, here, here's the thing that everyone understands, particularly during this time. Internet is, is a thing that um, is always a little unpredictable and has been a little bit more so. So don't worry. Everyone's got a healthy kind of... Uh, um, patients for for weird internet, but every it's coming through okay now. So why don't you just continue from there? Sure. Um, so with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, it caused inflammation in my right knee, and then also in my eyes, uh, something called uveitis. Uh, and the treatment they used to to treat the the uveitis had caused glaucoma. So they were able to actually control the uveitis, but not the glaucoma. The, gl the glaucoma uh, is something I still, you know, battle today with eye drops, uh, but have had several surgeries to lower the pressure. Uh, it's the pressure in the eyes um, affecting the optic nerve, which first takes peripheral vision. Um, and when I turned 18, uh, my visions was such that I was considered legally blind. Um, I was graduating from high school and was introduced to the New York State Commission for the Blind. Um, a man by the name of Ed Kaplan uh, had come to my home with a white cane uh, and showed me how, how to get around in my neighborhood using it. Um, and I used it mostly through my, my, college, my college days. Um, and then in 1990, Upon the graduation of college, um, I had had some experimental procedures done to control the glaucoma. Um, and there, there too, I then lost the remainder of my vision um, and, and relied heavily on the cane at that time. Um, and then after that, I went and got a guide dog from Smithtown Guide Dog Foundation. I went to work for a news day um, here on Long Island as a telemarketer and then quality assurance person. And I did that for about 14 years. Um, I got married, I have two children and, um, you know, often Judy. not a used cane travel, you need to be. A oh, sorry. Yeah. Just to, um, just to follow up on one part of your story there, cause I'm interested you know, as someone like yourself, who's both used a cane and a guide dog, I'm interested to talk about that distinction a little bit. But before we go into that, again, you were talking about, you know, first starting to use your cane. Can we just go to that for a moment and mm -hmm. kind of like, could you, could you walk us through a little bit of what that experience was like being someone who's, who's never used a cane before to learning how to use mm -hmm. one and kind of just let everyone know what that experience was like for you? Sure. Um, well, when I uh, first came to use the cane, um, I had some central vision that I could, you know, I could still see. Um, and the cane was only used when I needed it. And it, it was hard to come to use it because then it, it really made others aware of the fact that I couldn't see. And that was still something that I was still struggling with. Even to be called blind was very hard. I never liked that term. Um, and even using the cane, I didn't really like using the cane initially either. And so it took me a while. Um, he had come to show me how to use the bus, and how to walk around in my neighborhood, how to go to the, the store independently. Um, it, and it really was a safety, you know, because it, it, again, it explained to others that I couldn't see. And so people could offer assistance. And also, um, you know, it, it made me more confident traveling. I wasn't as timid, you know, because I was tripping on things and walking into things. Um, so it, you know, it was an adjustment period. 
not the easiest, but it took me a while. And then as my vision started to decline, I realized I needed to use it more. Um, and then, you know, then as, as I said, I went and I had gotten a guide dog. Um, and then um, now, after a, the birth of my children, uh, my dog had come to retire. And I then went back to using the cane. I've been toying with the idea of getting a dog, but there are some practical reasons as to why I haven't gotten a dog yet uh, as a guide. I have a pet at home for the kids and myself. And, um, you know, I use heavily the cane now, getting around, walking in my neighborhood, going to the grocery store, different events. Um, well, I definitely, I want to get more to that um, kind of distinction or differences between mm -hmm. uh, cane usage and guide dog shortly. But Monica, question for you, and you know, something I know when we got to connect about this earlier in the week, you, you definitely have a, a, a really good um, understanding of kind of the history of the white cane um, and, and kind of, you know, white cane awareness day by extension. You know, could you get, give us a little bit of an overview? Cause I know I found that really interesting as far as kind of like the earlier origins of the white cane to like where we are now. This is Monica, sure. You know, the, the white, the cane or a stick or a staff or anything like that, that goes back to really biblical times. I mean, you didn't think of like just growing up before you heard about what a white cane was. Maybe you were hiking in the woods, you'd pick up a stick and you'd use it to explore the ground maybe use it for support. So the use of a long object, a stick or whatever, goes back a long time. But it really, I mean, it even, maybe the 1800s, the late 1800s was the first documented use. However, there was a, a gentleman in the UK, his name was James Biggs from Bristol. And in 1921, I mean, James was an artist and he became blind. And he was using, um, I guess what we would call today, a cane. And he noticed drivers were not stopping when he was using the cane. So he was the first person documented to paint the cane white and to really increase drivers' acknowledgement that here there's someone crossing the street. And then the first documented really use in the United States was back in the 1930s. Um, when there was um, a president of the Lions Club, his name was George Bonham. He also painted a black cane white and put the red stripe at the bottom of the cane. And that's now known as the white cane in the United States. So I, I guess we could talk a little bit more as we go along. There's, maybe we could drop little hints along the way, Doug. Um, but really, the, the, next, the next big thing was when all of the vets were returning from World War II, um, Dr. Richard Hoover, he was really instrumental in developing long white cane. And in the field of orientation and mobility, the first really known technique for our profession was that of the Hoover method. And that was when individuals would tap the cane from side to side in a sweeping motion, but keeping it, really tapping it from side to side, keeping it kind of a little bit above the ground, but to probe their environment. And um, really, that's really how the training began. The first documented um, programs in the United States, of course, were started by the NFB, National Federation for the Blind, in the 60s, and then followed by Boston College in 1960 and Western Michigan University in 1961. So, there are so many dates um, within the field of orientation and mobility and also the journey of the cane, which I find the best timeline to be on AFB.org. They have a really great timeline that everyone can look at. I mean, that's the American Federation for the Blind. So, so much to learn, um, but it's, it's so great to know and um, understand what it's all about. And you know, you, Monica, some, part of what you just brought up, and thank you for that that little run through of a hi truncated history of the white cane there. Um, but you know, Monica, Judy, Monica was just talking about kind of the, the different tech, uh, cane usage techniques, and mm -hmm. certainly there's been an evolution of those over time. Can you talk about personally, um, you know, what cane you use now, and maybe if that's different from a cane that you started with, and maybe how your personal um, cane techniques have maybe changed or evolved over time? 
Mm -hmm. uh, when I first started using the cane, um, and, and I use now a graphite uh, four section cane that folds up and, um, but when I first started using it, it was more of an aluminum uh, kind of cane with a pencil tip uh, where I did a, a two point touch as Monica was talking about, um, you know, tapping back and forth in like an arc motion about a foot and a half in front of my, my body to protect me from anything coming and um, also it giving me uh, a little path that I know is clear. Um, but I, I use now more of a technique where it's swishing from you know left to right, right to left, uh, being in constant contact with, with the ground below me, uh, letting me know the terrain, you know, whether there's any holes or uh, curves. Um, also, the tapping also gives me some information about my environment as well the sound that I receive back from the tap, um, especially if you, I'm approaching a stairwell, the echo sounding or the, in a cement uh, inside of a building, the echo sound coming back kind of gives me an idea of how to get around uh, that there are things that are I'm approaching. Um, really, when you're using a cane, you're very much in touch with your environment. Not only the cane gives you information, but your other senses as, as well, such as the pavement under your feet, you know, or am I on grass, you know, using my feet helps me to also navigate. Um, I use the cane to trail along the grass line or along the sidewalk. Um, you know, I'm very conscious also of, is it going downhill or uphill, the pavement below me, you know, am, am I on gravel or you know, am I on grass when I'm outside? Um, then, of course, listening for different things, locating uh, different things helps to orient me in space. Uh, you know, the feel of the air around me, uh, sometimes turning a corner uh, on a street, you know, the draft from a building, you know, if you're in a hallway, it lets you know where, um, you know, there's a there's an open doorway or a corridor. So you use a lot of your senses or all of your senses um, in order to, to, to get around. And you know, Monica, again, Judy was kind of highlighting some of this and what she was just talking about, about her personal use, but can you, there are, um, I think what might not be apparent to a lot of people who don't use a cane is, is the fact, knowing the fact that there are a lot of different types of canes and certainly not just an evolution over time, but certainly different options as they stand now. Can you walk us through a little bit of like what some of the different types of canes are um, and, and, and fill us in on that a bit? Sure, this is Monica speaking. So the when the cane first came out, it was just a long, rigid cane. It also had a crook on the end of it, almost like a shepherd's crook. And that was initially designed in the way that you would hold it, travel to protect your wrists and your fingers as you were traveling. And the cane has evolved where the crook is no longer. It's almost like a golf grip on most canes today. Um, there are still rigid canes that are really great for people who travel every single day because they really take a beating <laughs> from the outside world. Um, most people today use a folding cane, which comes in different sections or they use a collapsible cane. And through all my years of teaching mobility, I always think you always wanna go with the preference of the individual, taking into consideration where they travel, how often they travel. You know, it may not be uncommon for someone to travel with a long rigid cane, but also have a folding cane in their bag because you never know, you know, something unfortunate could happen while they're traveling, the cane could be bent or broken and um, they would need to enact um, and use the second cane. So it's all personal preference. Um, there's aluminum canes, graphite, fiberglass, um, and I'm sure in the future there'll be different designs, making them lighter. Um, but it depends on the traveler too. You know, most people like a lighter weight cane because sometimes the tips weigh the cane down a little bit. And some people with balance challenges prefer a heavier cane. So it's just really about that individual traveler that makes the use of the cane important and the type of cane they use. So 
I guess as a specific example, if I'm someone who say um, uses a cane and lives in a in a city, but occasionally likes to like go on more like wilderness like tracks and hikes, I'll probably be using a different cane for each of those environments. Is that correct? This is Monica Shore. And, and, you know, you may use different tips as well. You know, there's various different tips. Like Judy said, you know, the first cane tip that, that was out was a pencil tip. And it was just a little narrow tip. And, and I'll be honest with you, when I was getting my, my training at Western Michigan and, and I used that pencil tip, boy, did they get caught in everything. Mm -hmm. um, but that was really the purpose of a cane is that it's supposed to tell you what's there on the ground but thank God there's been an evolution in tips, you know, where there's smaller tips, there's bigger tips, and they roll. And now there's options for everybody, which is great. And I always think as an instructor and in life, you always want options because without options, you're stuck. So you may have a few different tips depending on where you're traveling. And you know, Something that comes to mind when I think of like specifically White Cane Awareness Day and something that we were starting to get into of like the fact that it's it's an awareness day. Again, it's not not even so much for the people that use a white cane. Obviously, people who use a white cane are very aware of it. Part of the awareness day aspect is for everyone else, people who don't use a cane. We were starting to talk about, again, why, why it's important for other people to know about cane usage. And, and one of the things that comes to mind, I know we get asked this a lot when we do feeling through experiences and, you know, Judy, I kind of asked this question to you. And again, there's a, certainly with the caveat that there's no one size fits all answer to this, but how might you answer someone if they ask the question of, Hey, if, if I'm someone who's, who's doesn't use a cane, doesn't necessarily know much about that world. And I see someone out in the world, in a city per se, on a street with a cane, how do I know, how do I help that person or how do I know if I should help that person? How should I approach that situation? Again, there's no one size fits all answer to that, but how would you start to answer that question if someone asked that? Well, I think um, if a person is to approach a person who, who is using a white cane, the first thing that I would say is the nicest thing is to, to first ask, did they need assistance? And that way it gives the person using the cane to say yes or no, um, because some people are very independent and they know the route that they're going and may not need assistance. Um, so it kind of respects their dignity and allows them to, you know, say yes or no. And then if it is that the person does need assistance, because it does happen, you can get into areas where you don't know or you get disoriented, especially on a, a day where it may not be so nice out and the sounds are different. Uh, or, you know, if you're out in the, in the snow, it's a lot harder to feel your uh, landmarks and, and the pavement under your feet. Um, so uh, if a person does need assistance, um, you could offer them sighted guide uh, where you would offer them your elbow and then person would hold on to your elbow. And if you keep your elbow close to you uh, as you travel, uh, it, it then puts the person who can't see a little bit behind and uh, that puts the person in the lead who can see the person guiding. Um, and, and it's funny, but sometimes I've had experiences where even though I have my cane, you know, um, people don't always realize that I, I can't see. And I've even been to like a restaurant and a person has, you know, guided me to where I have to sit and at the table and then leaving the restaurant, they'll be walking me out and they'll be saying, they have said, you know, I'll walk you to your car. Where are you parked? And I'm thinking, <laughs> uh, they don't give me a license. <laughs> you know, it's not a good thing. Uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, it just, they just weren't able to put, you know, put it together. Or, or um, if, if say you were looking for something and you might ask, you know, where, where is the, uh, the bus stop? And a person will, will say, well, it's right over here. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> where is over here? If they're pointing, uh, it, you know, and that's what I'm doing right now with my hand. Oh, it's right over here. Uh, you know, so if a person can be very specific about the directions that they get and often too uh when a person is looking at a person the perspective 
is opposite. So, you know, my right is your left. And so if, and a lot of times people have trouble with that uh, when giving direction. You have to try to think of the perspective of the person who can't see in order to give the detailed description. You know, um, Judy, your, your example is so apt. It, it really points out the fact that the, the awareness day, the importance of the awareness day for other people, right? For, for there to be more awareness for people that when they see a cane, a white cane, even if they don't use one themselves, they know what it means. They have a better understanding and context of how to approach or not approach, right? A situ or ultimately a situation. But like if, if you start to associate with a white cane, if you start to associate um, some of the deeper understandings that you're sharing, someone will be more likely to not just say, oh, it's over there or point to a direction and actually have the deeper understanding of the context of the situation and make sure that either whether they're go going with you or describing where to go, that they understand how to do so. So it's actually helpful for you. Um, mm -hmm. So all, you know, again, great example that really illuminates why a, a white, white cane awareness day is an important day for other people who don't use canes to really understand that. And I'm going to, I want to get into a lot more of this in just a moment, but before we do so, I'm going to take a, a quick pause for an interpreter switch. Great. And all right, we're all switched over there. So, um, continuing here be, before I do again, I'm, I'm about to go to our, actually our first question here, but, um, you know, again, by all means, if for anyone who's watching, feel free to ask any questions that you might have. Um, I know that I've learned a lot, um, over the last week in preparing for this episode about white cane awareness day, and certainly a lot about white canes and why it's important to have a greater understanding. And if you have any questions, by all means, feel free to ask and we'll do our best to get to them. So Judy, this first question is for you. It happens to aptly come from a Judy as well who's asking the question. Um, so the question is, um, Judy, aside from the many practical safety uses for a white cane, what are some of the more symbolic things that are also important that you would like sighted people to be aware of? So we were just starting to get into this, but maybe if there's anything kind of to add to that, um, does, please go ahead, Judy. Um, symbolically, um, just it, you know, making it aware, the community aware that a person using a white cane, uh, is using it to get around, uh, because they cannot see, they have some type of vision loss. So it, it does symbolize, uh, vision loss, uh, and they are using this tool to navigate safely. Um, it's, you know, it is very liberating. It's the difference between staying home or getting out and doing things and, uh, and to do it independently because you can't always have somebody with you. Um, so it's a symbol of freedom um, and it's, it's a symbol of safety and it's a symbol of a, of a person who can't see and just trying to make their way as best as they can. Beautifully answered. Um, so, you know, I want to take a moment, you know, Monica, you, you had told us at the top of, of this episode when you introduced yourself a little bit more about, um, you know, who you, your profession and kind of the, the multiple hats you wear at the Helen Keller National Center. I'd love to just explore that a little bit more. Um, if you go like a little bit more into depth of, of those, the, the various avenues of what you do there and certainly how, how it directly applies to, to, to a lot of what we're discussing today around White Cane Awareness Day. Sure, this is Monica speaking. So I, I'm actually rounding out my 21st year at Helen Keller National Center. And um, I remember when I first started there back in December of 99, um, Dr. Gene Borkwin really took a chance on me. He was the supervisor of the O&M department at the time. And I was just a new mobility instructor. Um, and I, I knew how to instruct um, those with a visual impairment to, to total blindness, but I had no idea how to work with a, a dual sensory loss. And through all of these years and great mentorship from Gene and a lot of my colleagues, um, 
I've, I've really, I mean, I have to say that every single day working at Helen Keller is just magic. You have no idea what's going to happen. You know, the, the residential nature of the center helps us to really support everyone who comes to learn. And everyone, you know, is so different. And I, I was having a conversation with my, one of my colleagues, um, I think it was yesterday, and, you know, I, Deaf blindness or blindness or deafness, it's just a part of who you are as, as an individual. It's not a label that should identify or, you know, really make who you are. It's just a, a characteristic of you. And I viewed every single person that I've worked with over these past 21 years. It's just that. Someone was asking me, like, what what do you do with, with all of them? You know, every single person. I said, no, no, no. What do I do with each of them? And I, I think that's probably the biggest thing I've done over the years is that I've worked with each individual and with all of my colleagues to help them achieve whatever it is that they're looking for. If it's traveling out to the community, traveling to a work site, um, traveling to college. And, you know, I'm so, so fortunate to have both the low vision department and the audiology department because most blind rehab centers around the country do not have an audiology department. So we're so fortunate to be able to say, hey, so-and-so went out on a mobility lesson today and they were identifying traffic sounds. Can we have the audiologist come out with us and really understand what equipment they need? You know, there's a mobility setting on hearing aids that is so great to turn on when you're out there traveling. Or maybe there's an assistive listening device that would help in maybe a quiet area where we're talking about a lesson. And my mobility and or my low vision instructor, she will actually say, hey, you know, we need to add some some medical filters to, you know, which are known as sunglasses to help someone see better when they're walking from a well area to a shady area. I mean, we just have the ultimate team at Helen Keller National Center that we look at people in a 360 degree view. And, and it's just a gift to be able to work with everyone every single day and, and to know that each individual that comes truly leads their program. We're just a part of their journey. And I'm so grateful to be a part of it. Well, Monica, so, so many gems that you just had in there. And, you know, certainly as someone who's had the distinct pleasure and honor to to work with the Helen Keller National Center for quite some time now, I can certainly second everything you're saying about um, HKNC. And you know, something else that came up um, for me, and again, I just keep filtering this through White Cane Awareness Day. Something that was so great that came up for me and what you were just saying is, you know, when, when you're saying when asked, oh, what do you do with all of them? You say, what do I do with each of them? And really seeing each person as a person with, with um, their disability, whether again, in your case, dealing with deaf blindness, um, in Judy's case, you know, blind and like, talking about the blind and low vision population, is certainly that's an aspect of who you are, but it's one aspect of many. And seeing someone as this fully formed human that like when I think of back to the question of, well, what do I do when I approach someone and see if they need help? Well, a good thing to start with is maybe start thinking of the person as a person and not as their disability, because that'll probably right off the bat really inform how you're going to go about talking to them, right? You're, um, and then I think that's, it's, it comes so much of the awareness that we talk about on a regular basis. And, you know, obviously around in this case, white cane awareness day, or whether it's um, deaf blind awareness week, there's certainly unique aspects to each one of them, but I feel like a fundamental cornerstone of each is, if you were to see each person as a person, and in, in these cases, not as their disability, you're gonna be in pretty good shape for everything else that follows. And you know, certainly as someone who you know, is maybe about three years into really my formal education of, of the deaf, blind, blind and low vision communities, and certainly learning on a daily basis, I always say, if, if, you, if you're grounded in that, you're gonna do well, because if you maybe, um, you know, say something a little bit, you know, not in the best way you could or whatever it is that you don't know, if it's coming from that place, someone will be more than happy to, to fill in whatever gaps of understanding you have. I feel like it's really only starts to be really offensive and off-putting when you treat someone 
not like a person, but as their disability is where kind of like most of the problems arise, right? So again, Monica, so much in what you said there really, really helped illuminate that point. And, and I want to come back to some of it more in a moment, but first, another question for you, Judy. Yes. And you got a little bit of activity back there. Going there yes. Hold on one second. I just want to let, hold on one second. Sure. It's just, you know, this is one of the, one of the things about when we're live now, we're all, our, our offices, our whole worlds, our homes, certainly dealing with a few more elements than normal there. But uh, it looks like uh, maybe Judy, you got things to settle down a little bit over there. Yes, let's hope. <laughs> I'm an active household. Well, look, whoever, um, whoever's there, if they end up keep talking, we're going to have to just pull them into this episode. Yeah, that's right, right? <laughs> but, uh, uh, but again, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Judy. No, I, I wanted to uh, also talk about uh, the fact that um, I am a member of, of the American Council of the Blind, which is another national organization. Um, and we've done a lot to uh, make the, the blind community aware of accessible traffic signals, in, which is another important uh, pedestrian safety uh, tool. Uh, where we actually get access to uh, pedestrian signals, traffic signals. You know, it's, an, it's uh, something that's auditory as well as it vibrates. Um, and I've had uh, the opportunity to have two of them installed in, in my uh, area. And um, what it actually does, as anyone would approach an intersection, and if it has a pedestrian uh, I think they call it a ped head, uh, where you know you see that picture of the little guy that's going to walk or not walk the uh, pedestrian signal. Uh, where you when you hit the button on the on the pedestrian signal, it will let you know that it's safe to walk or that the, the sign is now saying to walk. So it'll actually put it out auditorily or it will vibrate. There's a, on the ones that we have here in town, uh, the, the, uh, it's like an embossed arrow that starts vibrating when, when the pedestrian signal walk sign is on. So it's, it's access to information that you would see visually or hear. Well, you wouldn't hear a signal, but, but these signals you can hear. <laughs> gotcha. Um, um, you know, it lets you know when, when the light has turned, turned green. And though you still need to s still be aware of traffic around you because anything mechanical, you know, can break. So you still need your, your, your mobility skills and training to listen for traffic. Um, and there's a lot that goes into the training crossing a very busy intersection. Uh, and I'm sure Monica could give you more on that. But um, you know, you have to listen for walking with the traffic parallel, uh, and that using a blocker, a car as a blocker, uh, does take a lot of guts to do that. And I and um, using the accessible signals do certainly help. Um, and so I'm glad that they do. They have these things. <laughs> you know, yeah, these certainly. are relatively new. Um, I would say within the last, I would say 10 to 15 years, maybe they've had them, um, but not everybody knows about them. And it's based on need. You know, it's, it's part of the Americans with Disabilities Act. There's a section uh, that talks about access to um, signage or environmental um, signs uh, and or uh, there, I can't remember the exact wording, but it's giving us access to something that you would normally have visually. And um, in order to get one installed, you do need to contact the municipality that governs your traffic signal. So you have to know, is it a state road? Is it a county road? Um, and then you have to write to them and you have to let them know your need and then somebody will come down and evaluate. But the more people are aware of it and the more people ask for it, the more that it'll, it'll become, you know, a common place in, in the community. 
and it not only helps people with low vision, it doesn't, it not only helps people who are deaf blind, but it helps, you know, uh, people, elderly people crossing intersections, um, mothers who might be traveling with their children. It's just another tool um, that we all can benefit from. And you know, Judy, we're, you know, you've aptly pointed out the the importance of advocacy. Certainly, that's something that has been a big part of our discussions, often on this platform. Certainly, you know, recently, uh, you know, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And you know, Monica, question that comes from that is around, you know, obviously, um, you know, Judy was describing kind of like this kind of. Uh, um, you know, in her immediate environment advocacy with, you know, the kind of the local municipalities to get this, this, uh, accessible traffic, uh, light in, installed. Um, what about how, how does advocacy play in when you're training someone like their personal advocacy on like a moment to moment basis? How does that play into your work, uh, when working with people, um, in mobility? This is Monica speaking. I, I think that's a very foundation in, in how we serve every single person that comes to Helen Keller is that their voice matters and it matters a lot, just like all of our voices matter. And that, you know, with time and practice, your voice gets stronger. You know, in the beginning, when you're advocating to get assistance at a store, maybe you're fully blind and you're getting, it's, it's scary. It's, it's, the same level of being scary when maybe we go on public transportation for the first time. Every first time in life is scary to all of us. And I think when you bring a sense of norm normalcy to the training and saying like, you know, we're all the same with our fears, you know, the fears just may be different, but learning how to speak up and say, this is what I need. Like, for example, when Judy was saying, you know, when you're guiding someone, you could just, you know, say, how can I help you? And you can help your student find their voice saying, can I take your arm? You know, because people want to help. What they may do is they may push, pull, tell you it's okay to cross the street. And you're like, hello, I'm blind. I can't see where to go. Or I'm deafblind. I can't hear or see anything. Um, but if you have the words, whether they're spoken, written, or gestural, you can advocate for yourself. And we do a lot of that practice in all of our classes at Helen Keller, especially in mobility, you know, we practice a lot at street corners with how to accept human guide assistance and how to advocate for the right assistance. Because in life, all of us, how is anyone supposed to know what we need if we can't say what we need or demonstrate what we need? So that practice is so important. And you know what? We're all forever advocates of our own needs. And that will just never stop. Uh, you know, Monica, I feel like I could, um, I feel like I could derive like many wise quotes from, from many of what you're <laughs> sharing today. Um, and something, you know, that you were just talking about that again, we spoke about earlier when Judy, you were talking about answering the question of like someone who asked, how can I help? Or if I should help Alice Edie, a dear friend of ours, notes and you know kind of in conjunction with what you were just talking about monica she says please stress why it's so important not to grab a blind or deafblind person in an effort to force assistance upon them you create fear not the impression that you want to be helpful especially since some of us can't hear you approaching so certainly alice i hope i believe monica was just speaking to that but you know really as you just detailed alice in, in addition to what Monica, you just shared, and Judy, what you shared earlier, uh, certainly that's a point that can't be spoken enough and can't be made um, to be people to be made more aware of because it's certainly an important one and something that certainly a lot of people um, in the deaf, blind, blind, and low vision communities have to deal with on a pretty regular basis. Um, uh, you know, please, sorry. Judy, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just I wanted to say that I've had the experience where I was at a corner and was going to cross and somebody came over and, and not knowing, I guess, how to, to, to ask, took my arm and I ended up actually crossing over, you know, the, the wrong street. <laughs> so now I had two streets to cross in order to get to where I needed to go. And it, and the intention was good. And, you know, because we really weren't communicating this is early on and, you know, we were 
really communicating. I wasn't communicating my, what I really needed and they weren't really asking either. And I was going, you know, they were taking me. <laughs> and so, like I said, sometimes if you don't ask and you don't say, then you might end up on the wrong street corner <laughs> and having more work to do. <laughs> um, right. That's, that's such a, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Monica. <laughs> Judy, that is just so true. It's just like, you know, with time, you, you have a better understanding of your environment and where you want to go because, you know, as Dr. Gene, you know, when he was doing all of his research on the street crossing card and, and all of his research, you know, in deaf blind travel, you know, he, what he found was that people truly want to help. But often when it comes to street crossings, they will help you in the direction they are traveling. And sometimes if you don't let go of their arm, they will help you across several more streets too. <laughs> just under that, they're just being nice. Mm -hmm. And and you know, in mobility, a lot of times we let that happen. You have to let those things happen to have a moment of, oh, okay, now I need to pay attention because I need to get places. Mm -hmm. um, but those things will happen. And, and I think the other thing I wanted to say, um, is that, you know, when people grab, push, pull, and try to help someone who's visually impaired or blind, just take a moment and consider anyone who's not visually impaired or blind. Would you push, pull, or grab them? No. So don't touch, please. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. It's like, yeah, well, maybe if you just applied how you treat anyone else to the situation, that's a great place to start from because you wouldn't do that for anyone else. Certainly people right. who are sighted and hearing sometimes need help navigating a space too or need directions and you're not going to like go up and grab them without communicating with them either. So, you know, great, great, well put there. Um, Judy, there's another question for you from Kiman. Um, and uh, Kaman asks, what is the uh, practical differences between having a cane and a guide dog? And does having one mean you don't use the other? Um, well, there, there are pros and cons to both. Um, and if anybody just heard the dog barking in the backyard, uh, she's, she's my house pet. She's not a guide. Obviously, your dog can obviously hear our conversation in this wanting to speak for, for itself. <laughs> um, and so sometimes dogs have their own minds and want to do what, what they want to do. So that is a kind of a drawback. Uh, using a cane is something you can fold up and put in your pocketbook and, you know, have when you need it, whenever you need it. Um, it you know, dogs can sometimes be stubborn and not always want to do what you want to do. <laughs> as my dog is talking now um and then uh also the cane puts you in in touch with your environment uh, you know you can find a landmark easier with a cane that you might be using like going down here when i was taking the kids to the bus stop you know when they were getting on the school bus to go to school um you know i was holding hand and of my daughter and using the cane to get to the bus stop and I, I would know that as I uh, came to a certain part, uh, there was a fence. And, you know, if I had a guide dog, the, the dog would go right around it and I wouldn't know, you know, and it's a little disorienting at times, uh, you know, not knowing if I've passed my landmark or am I at my landmark or like even a, a mailbox that I used to use as, okay, this is where I have to go and then it's up a little bit and I make my turn. So canes definitely let you know of your environment, oh, but guide dogs will um, go, you'll go a lot quicker with a dog because they're not stopping and, you know, they're, unless they're distracted and then that wouldn't be good. But um, I mean, most guide dogs are very disciplined and, and the team has to be very disciplined. It's not you're both are working together you have to know where you're going and you have to still listen uh, as to where you are um it's a lot of commitment uh, you know dogs need care they need to be walked and fed and uh, taken out for a break i when i went to um when i was working uh, at newsday I had to find a relief area for, for, you know, where I could take my dog out. And, 
you know, Kane, you don't have to take your dog out. Uh, you don't have to take your cane for a potty break. <laughs> that would be a very special type of cane. I'm not sure they've come up with that one yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, but of course, a, a dog is, uh, you know, it's your friend, you know, it's, it's your companion. It's, uh, they're very sweet and, uh, and lovable. Um, you know, they're good friendship too. So again, I can remember a time when, um, I was in a cab and I had my dog and, uh, getting the dog to get down and under and in the little space and they've been trained to do it, but my dog was very stubborn and wanted to get up on the seat with me, you know, and that would, didn't sit too well with the cab driver and, and I don't, I don't blame him, but you know, <laughs> you don't want to be sitting there all day fighting with your dog, <laughs> you know, get down on the ground. So, um, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons. Like I said, like a, a guide dog will prevent you from getting hit by a car, you know, falling down stairwell. You don't need to take as much, uh, time to, uh, you know, get assistance from people because, you know, the, once you've gone through a route and a dog, you've trained with the dog and you, you know where you're going and it's a lot quicker and they will prevent you. Like I said, any oncoming tra traffic, they're trained to disobey a command as well. Um, you're putting all your trust in, in an animal. So that's a, a big thing to adapt to as well. Um, and, and they are, you know, things happen and sometimes like they can get distracted and you know things i was I think i shared with you the other day how i one of the first trips to the park with my guide dog aster uh she was sniffing the ground she was very interested in something on the ground and i kept telling her you know hop up hop up and she wasn't going and, and i thought well come on you know you're, you're being stubborn she's sniffing and i went forward and fell right into the pond you know, up to my knees in water. Um, and she wasn't going, she wasn't budging. And I just figured, you know, that she was more interested in, in what the park had to offer. And, you know, I, I didn't, wasn't reading her correctly and, you know, went into to the water. So um, it's a lot involved <laughs> in, in both cases, a lot of training, a lot of practice, Practice helps. Uh, going over things a lot helps. Trying to learn the routes, you know, if you use the same routes, it, it helps. You know, on, on a related note, and we have a great question here uh, from Alana, and this is actually something I didn't know till very recently, but I, I'm, Monica, maybe if you could take this one, she asks, are there benefits to a guide mini horse? And are there any drawbacks? Do you know anything about that subject? Because I personally did not even know that there were mini horse guides until very recently. Is that something that has come across your uh, your experience mm -hmm. at any point? Well, I have heard about them, and what I and I don't know much about them. I, I was kind of interested in finding out more myself, but I think um, they they wear diapers. I think uh, so. I don't know as far as like the maintenance of uh, you know that might might be a drawback. Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, what, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, Monica, and you're, I, I know that you've worked with guide dogs, obviously. Has uh, a, a guide mini horse ever come up for you or do you know anyone that uses them? This is Monica. No, I, I haven't. We haven't built the stables yet at Helen Keller. <laughs> 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 um, but from what I know, the, the guide ponies or mini horses that are out there are, have been used for people who live in more country-like settings. Um, I can't foresee them being used in urban or, you know, residential settings because they do require more space. But I don't think there's any a downfall to any of the, the things that individuals use to travel as long as they're using it to benefit themselves. And, you know, I just want to go back to that point that Judy was making about her dog, Aster was that whether you're using a cane or a guide dog or a guide pony, you never go forward in the world when you're traveling outside of your home specifically without the dog going forward, the pony going forward, or your cane going forward because they're clearing the path for you to go forward. And I think that's, I mean, if, if that's one last thing I have to say, you know, today regarding White Cane Awareness Day is that 
it's so important to probe your environment, you know, to make sure it's safe to forge ahead. And, you know, all of these tools and living animals that help everybody, the, the goal is overall safety. But as Judy so, you know, carefully pointed out, the traveler is the person in charge, you know, they're the ones that make the decisions. And like you said, Judy, it's, it's a tool and it's, it's really about independence and freedom and thank God there's white canes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And you know, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here today, but we still have a little bit of time left. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, Judy, starting with you with the last, um, you know, maybe for our, with our last, you know, 30 seconds each here, uh, if there's anything that you'd like to share in closing, um, it could be something about white cane awareness day or just, you know, any kind of sentiments you want to leave with? Is there, is there anything you'd like to share? Well, recently with being at Helen Keller Services, um, and I'm on, in their team program right now, and uh, I'm, I'm there with other people who have been newly blinded, more recent than I. I've, I've been now without my vision longer than I had been with my vision. I lost my sight when I was 22, totally. And now I'm 52, so 30 years without vision. And what I would say to somebody who recently lost their sight is don't be afraid to get out and do, to use the tools that are being given to you. Don't let it keep you inside because when you're out and amongst everybody, that's, that's what it's all about, life experience touching others and, and i know coronavirus right now has us afraid to do that and it's you know putting distance and um but but not to be afraid to to ask for assistance um and realize that you have skill and have talent and we all have it, it, we practice our skills we get better so i think really the key is practice be confident, put your foot forward with your safety devices, but get out and do, don't, don't isolate yourself. Well, truly beautifully put there, Judy, and thank you for sharing that. I'm sure that that resonates with a lot of people who are watching. Um, Monica, just same to you. I'm wondering just if, it, if you have any kind of final sentiments to express whatever that might be. This is Monica speaking. Just just um, a word of encouragement, you know, for anyone who is newly diagnosed with a visual impairment or on their way to total blindness, you know, it's important to start. It's important to start your journey with a white cane. Um, I always like to say, just attach it to your body, either with a carabiner clip or a cane holster, get used to having it on you and start using it. You know, every bit of practice, whether it's a math homework or using your cane practice, does make perfect and without that cane you're truly not safe so start using it today start your journey if you're out there and you're newly diagnosed reach out and get some help you know it's a beautiful journey well thank you for sharing that Monica and, and obviously you know one of the places people can reach out to is is Helen Keller National Center you can go to HelenKeller.org certainly to find out more about all the services that the whole Helen Keller network provides. And Judy, was there was there something that you wanted to note before we sign out here? Yes, that also I would encourage people who are sighted not to be afraid to talk to somebody who, you know, is visually impaired, to reach out and ask, respect as as we had talked about before, you know, might make a new friend. Um, you know, if somebody needs assistance, never shy away from it you know, to offer, and then to just respect whatever answer you, you receive, whether it's no, I'm fine, or yes, thank you. And this is the way, you know, I can help, you know, let, let them know what it is you need, like you said, to ad advocate that way. That's really, that's communication. That's reaching out and touching that builds community. Yeah. And you know, Judy, to, to just kind of pick up what you were just talking about, I can certainly second that you know, as someone in myself where, you know, kind of one of the, one of the great life journeys that I've been on over the last few years was, was in, uh, all stems from, from me connecting with, um, 
Artemio, a deaf blind man one night laid on a, on a New York City street corner and all the gifts that have come from there. Um, certainly a lot of great relationships, really close friendships um, uh, within the deaf blind community, blind and low vision community. So I, I'm, I'm definitely living proof on the other side of what you're saying as far as, you know, how, how much value connecting with, the, with all types of people can, can really provide in your life. And, you know, I just want to thank both of you, Monica and Judy, for joining us today. It was really quite, quite a pleasure. And I'm really glad that we got to, you know, talk not just about White Cane Awareness Day, but certainly a lot of really interesting issues that stem from that. And I want to thank all of you who joined us today. Um, it's uh, been a pleasure to have you all you asked some great questions today and certainly had some great, great comments to share. Um, as always, again, reminder to White Cane Awareness Day, um, also known as White Cane Safety Day is on October 15th, which is a Thursday. So clearly we're doing this on, we do these on Friday, so we wanted to do it the Friday before, but certainly there's still plenty of time to share whatever you've learned today with others um, and certainly help raise awareness leading up to and then on October 15th, which is White Cane Awareness Day. So with that said, Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will be back again next week, same time, same place, with another episode of Feeling Through Live. And until then, we hope you have a wonderful weekend and week ahead. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.